Welcome to a podcast about wealth and life with the advisors from Foster and Motley. In this podcast, they share their mission to help individuals, couples, and families achieve the life they envision by providing a comprehensive wealth management experience. Join this seasoned team of experts as they explore actionable steps to improve your financial well-being and answer your most pressing questions. Take the time now to make sure your family knows what you want done later. Yes, we're talking about estate planning. Not just getting the plan together, though, but sharing it with the people who count. I'm Patrice Sikora, and in this episode of Foster and Motley's podcast about wealth and life, financial planner Dave Kneenaber and investment manager Tom Guidi are back to lay it all out for us and help you understand why these conversations are so important. Dave, you were with us back in episode three. That's when we focused on getting estate planning wishes implemented, but that was financial account titling, beneficiaries, that kind of stuff. Once you've done that, what is the next step? Well, thank you, Patrice. I think we're talking about a good, better, best model here. Good is getting estate documents in place and laying out your wishes Better is coordinating those documents with your account titling and beneficiaries, as we talked about in the previous episode. And today we talk about the best version, which is do both of those preliminary foundational pieces and then share it with the people that mean the most to you. And that can come in the form of a letter to your family, or as Tom and I have done with a number of families, have a family conversation about the goals of your estate plan and important documents. Seems like a logical step. Don't people do it? I have yet to meet someone that says, you know what? Next Wednesday, we're going to sit down as a family and talk about me dying and my wishes. Uh, That just doesn't come up in normal family (laughs) conversation. (laughs) Yeah, I can see that. So how do you get them going? Well, we get it on the calendar. We first share with them that it's important. I first came across this concept of a family letter, a family meeting in an article that Dave Foster wrote 10 years ago. I actually went back this morning to look for that article, but he uh, explained the family communication is the softer side of estate planning. And frankly, I think very few folks do it. When Tom and I get in a room with the family, you can kind of see the anxiousness about what are we here to discuss? And then over a 45-minute hour meeting, however long it takes, you can just start to see the weight come off of everyone's shoulder that they maybe had some lingering questions, they had some concerns, and just having good family communication is really powerful. Where do you start? I mean, as you say, you sit them down in the office and say, okay, we're going to talk about you dying. Where do you start with this? A starting point is simply... Tom and I sharing some experiences of what's worked for other families and then making the agenda customized to the family that we're working with. So, you know, one of the discussion points is simply who are your helpers, allowing your family members to know what they've been appointed to do, whether during your life with a power of attorney or a healthcare power of attorney, or at death as the trustee or the executor of an estate. But then we help formulate other parts of the agenda. Like, do you want to share numbers? I'll never forget when Tom and I had one of these first conversations, the family sits down and they say, is this the meeting where we learn how much we get when mom and dad die? Are you kidding? (laughs) Whoa. So clearly that family member already had an agenda in their (laughs) mind, but we worked with the parents to come up with, are we sharing numbers? Are there particular family circumstances about maybe someone who thinks they're going to be the financial helper and you're appointing a different sibling? So we come up with a game plan for all of those unique family circumstances. You're asking them to really open themselves up and and make themselves vulnerable, aren't you? That's the toughest part of this because you don't know what's going to come up. You're completely vulnerable. You're saying, hey, as of today, these are my wishes things can change. There are a lot of misconceptions out there with estate planning. Typically, people only experience this a couple times in their life. And maybe your uncle's estate looks a lot different than your parents' estate and mistakes that were made can create a lot of confusion and misinformation. And absolutely, you're vulnerable laying it out. These are my wishes with my estate plan. 
Tom, talk to me about why you really need to have this conversation while you're still alive. Well, if you're doing it while you're alive, it's a chance to be a dialogue, a dialogue where the your kids or those people important to you can ask questions and you can answer questions and make sure that you're covering all their concerns as well as your concerns. Otherwise, if you're doing it with a letter, which can be good, or through a will or other estate planning documents, it can be filtered through an attorney in the language that they like to use. But when you're doing it face-to-face, being able to ask and answer questions is invaluable. And how do the families generally take this, the, the, uh, the kids? Do they accept this? Are they skeptical? How do they approach it? Yeah, as Dave alluded to, I think skepticism is a very natural reaction when you say, well, we're going to sit down and spend an hour, hour and a half and talk about money. They don't know what's going to happen during that conversation. They don't know what the goals of the conversation are. So skepticism is very natural. But there's also relief when it's all out on the table. Mm, I can believe that. Yeah, I'm often surprised at the relief that's felt when the agenda feels pretty simple. And Tom and I see clients that leave the table and say, wow, that was so helpful. I'm going to go encourage my in-laws to have that conversation, or I'm going to do it myself. And just the uh, exponential impact that can have on family communication is really impressive. Have you got any examples you can share uh, of families where Clear instructions were not left. (laughs) I think that's the norm that's out there. Pick 99% of estates. I mean, when we talk about good, better, best, very few people get to the better estate plan where they have the documents, they have titling and beneficiaries in place. So I do think this is unique. We do have a guide out there on our website. Uh, You simply have to type in Foster and Motley final letter, and it's going to be the first Google result of kind of a template on what are the things that aren't in your estate document, you know, where you keep your passwords, where you keep important documents, who your advisors are, who to contact, have you prepaid a funeral expense? There's a lot of different things. And for some folks, not all of those are going to apply, but there that kind of laundry list is a great starting point or what are the items that I have to communicate that aren't part of my will or of my trust. Yeah. Unfortunately, when somebody passes away, it does seem to be the norm that you hear there's conflict between the people they leave behind. Conflict about how did they handle their healthcare wishes in their final days. Conflict with somebody handled their finances in their final days. And a lot of that conflict just arises from lack of communication. I remember in my own family, when my grandfather was getting older, his wife had predeceased him, and he was in a tough way. And one of my cousins moved in with him and lived with him for about a year. And she was able to help, not with all the healthcare things, but shopping and keeping him company. And in that year, his house really felt like her home because she was living there too. She had grown up just uh, up the street. And when he passed away, she had thought to herself, well, I'd like to live here after he passed away. I don't know if that was his wish or not, but it wasn't ever put in his will. It wasn't really talked about among the family. And when he passed away, she didn't have the financial resources necessary to buy the house at the time. So she didn't end up living there. So she had to move out after he died so they could sell the house and close his estate. And we'll never know what my grandfather's real wishes were. Well, Tom, I would think chances are he didn't know what his wishes were. They were ever evolving. She had moved in and helped when he really needed the help. And Life and estate documents are a work in progress and goals change and they can change quickly. And that's the tough part about it is just in a several year period, his goals, I'm certain, evolved over time. Yeah. And it's because he never had a conversation with her about it. And he never had a conversation with the other family members about that possibility. 
And that brings up a question, too. Suppose he had had a conversation with her, but hadn't shared it with any of the other members of the family. How do you say, what do you do? Well, in that case, you really, the legal documents determine how they pass. So what we're talking about today with this letter of instruction, a family meeting, it's really the informal side of settling the estate and wishes for your funeral and kind of the softer side. In that case, the documents are going to dictate whether she receives the house or funds to buy the house, et cetera. Does it often happen that other members of the family in that kind of a case will step in and say, let's talk about this? Or is it left to the executor to decide? Yeah, it's really up to the executor and the trustee to make those distributions. Um, It gets complicated quickly. So if the family were to receive that house and then say, you know what, we agree. Grandpa probably wanted you to have this place. Then they have their own gift tax and other issues that they have to face to make that gift. And you have to have a all the recipients of his will, his estate, make that decision together. And it almost has to be unanimous for that to happen. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of conflict in the family again. Absolutely. And, you know, the discussion for today is how do we limit those conflicts? How do we create harmony? And how do we allow people to grieve? Because a lot of these decisions are being made at a time when you just lost a loved one. And the last thing you want to do is make decisions that are going to have winners and losers within the family and create that conflict. Hmm. All right. So you start with the family letter. Tell me a little bit more about that. And then what would be the next steps after that? Well, I think the the family letter template that's on our website is a great place to start. I've personally gone through it and it probably needs to be updated every year or two just because circumstances change, accounts that you have, password, it's all actively changing. So I would start with the template. I would get your spouse involved. Perhaps they have an entirely different letter that what you may want for your funeral may look completely different for your spouse. So I, in the case of a married couple, would really encourage each person to kind of have their final letter. You mentioned passwords there, and I will share something with you. My father died about a year and a half ago. He kept all the passwords that he had to himself. My mother was left going, what password? What password are you talking about? What account are we talking about? It was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. So passwords, yes, very important. I'm sorry, go ahead. Then who else do we reach out to here too? I think this is about, so who do we reach out for help? This is instructing the kids or those you leave behind. Who do you go to after I pass away? Who's my attorney? Who's my accountant? Who are the people that help me with my financial life during my lifetime and are going to help you resolve things afterwards? And who would they include? So this is going to be your CPA, your financial planner, also very important, insurance agents, and any other advisors that you have, an attorney. Mm, Okay. And again, you did mention the passwords there. What else should be in this letter? Where do you have accounts? Who are your advisors? Where do you keep your will and trust document at? So many people go to the bank and they get a free toaster to open up a new account and they open a new account. And then there's a savings account that they held jointly with a parent while they were paying some final expenses. So typically when we first meet with clients, their balance sheet, their net worth statement is a mess and there's accounts everywhere. So Part of it, of this, when you lay it all out on paper, is you just see where all the accounts are, and it can be a good exercise to consolidate and simplify your financial affairs. And how about other assets, maybe just not bank accounts? Yeah, the uh, formal term, I believe, is stuff. Uh, Tom and I, (laughs) (laughs) Tom and I recently met with a family and the parents were sharing that, yeah, we've put together our documents. We just don't know how to share the stuff. And the kids said, we don't want your stuff. (laughs) Ah. And after the sting of that kind of uh, evaporated, that helped our clients reevaluate what they hold on to, knowing that 
personal belongings, the, the kids saw that as more of a hassle than something that they really wanted. So that gave our clients some freedom to review what stuff they keep, knowing that their kids weren't looking forward to uh, inheriting that. I think I've threatened my parents with uh, renting a dumpster after they pass away and parking it in their driveway. And that's how we're going to resolve the, the stuff question. But there's some valuable things in there as well. And I think about all the stuff I don't want. But I remember when, when my grandfather, grandmother passed away, the most valuable thing probably had zero monetary value. It was all the family pictures. So it's this cardboard box of black and white photos that got packed away after grandparents moved out of the house and into the nursing home. And there were, you know, they had room for, you know, maybe a half dozen picture frames, but they had a lifetime of these black and white photos, mostly black and white. And there was five kids. There were 20 grandkids. Some of them in some of the pictures, but you know, not always. And they all valued every one of those pictures. And today we have digital pictures, which are, you know, don't need a cardboard box, but they're just as valuable. Mm. There's probably a lot more of them too. True. But I'm curious what happened to the pictures? My uncle kept them for a couple of years and then eventually they got distributed. It took a lot of pressure. He really liked those pictures. I think he must have been the executor of the estate or just the first one that grabbed that cardboard box. I think he promised to make copies and he he made some copies of some, but eventually they kind of got distributed as, um, as appropriate. And let's face it, there was a generation where collectibles were everything, all those little Hummels or Yadro, whatever. (laughs) Do you have room for Hummels? I doubt Tom has room, but I am curious if there was an electronic version of the picture saved or some way that you're able to distribute those to the the family versus just the original format. Yeah, I think at the time, now this was 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And I think everybody got a couple CDs with some of the best pictures and they were scanned in. So he found a local place to do some scanning. And I'm sure now the scanner that I got for $120, you know, that's also a printer probably does just as good of a job as that CD from back then. So it's interesting how everything kind of evolves today with all the digital photography. It would be great to have a plan about how to distribute those digital photographs so everybody gets all of the pictures instead of having to share a couple hundred pictures between five kids. Mm, Yeah. I recently met with a client who was trying to determine how to pass the family Bible. And this Bible was more than a hundred years old. And it was so cool. It listed all the dates of birth and the baptism dates and dates people passed and it just had this really rich family history and the client was thinking what one person am I going to give this to and one of my colleagues mentioned well why don't you digitize it and you can give it to a lot of family members and that was a real aha moment for them there's companies that do this kind of work and to Tom's point about being able to share it with more people than just that original copy what about a pet Yeah, that's a great point, Patrice. A lot of folks will carve out money for their pet because it's one thing to have someone that's going to take good care of your pet, but that also is going to need financial Mm -hmm. resources for food and vet visits and the whole bit. Yeah, that's a really good point. I do see some clients that stipulate that in their documents, but I would put them in the minority of folks. I think there's a lot of people that have a pet and have no idea who would end up caring for their pet. Tom, have you seen that come up? I have not seen it come up, but I imagine that is much more of a conversation that you need to have because you might assume one of your kids wants your pet or one of your kids will at least take care of your pet, but you don't know that until you talk with, talk with them. I did see a posting online, which is one reason I brought that up. An 80 year old, the dog, a two year old dog is up for adoption because this 80-year-old pet parent uh, died. I mean, two years old, 
well, I hate to say this, but what were you doing adopting a puppy at the age of 78? You've got to make plans. Yep, absolutely. And that's one of those things that I hadn't thought about coming into this conversation. That's exactly the kind of topic that can come up in a family meeting. So that's a great point, Patrice. Who should be involved in this conversation? I mean, I'm guessing, yes, the parent, parents, the kids. Do they come kicking and screaming and who else should be included? I think the most common setup is for parents and their children. Typically, your children are going to be your first line of defense to serve as your power of attorney, to oversee health care items, and potentially be your executor and your trustee. So that's the most common setup we've seen. For folks that don't have children, it may be nieces and nephews, and that can add a whole different dynamic to a meeting as you have different sides of the family coming together. But really, you want your decision makers there. You want the folks that are going to be implementing your wishes and ultimately receiving some of your assets as well. Tom, any thoughts? What about kids' spouses, Dave? (laughs) How often do you see them included? Yeah. That is a great question. It's kind of like showing numbers. 50% of folks don't want to show numbers and 50% say, how can we have a conversation if we don't show a net worth and the the details? Spouses, I think, are pretty similar to that. I see about half the folks don't want to include the spouses, half do. And so it's really unique to each family and the dynamics. And it can get pretty complicated with spouses in the room as to exactly what you share. What are your thoughts on the spouses? And have you seen that? work out or have you seen some issues with spouses in the room? I think my parents would have the spouses in the room and I'm certain my wife's family would not. (laughs) Well, you just proved my 50-50 hypothesis. That's right. And my wife is one of seven and I am one of two. So it's probably, it would be much bigger room if everybody's in the room for my wife's family. I do find it a little uncomfortable with in-laws in the room. There's some things you just don't want to say out loud. Uh, For instance, when you receive your inheritance, it's to your advantage to keep that separate from becoming a joint asset and therefore a marital asset. And it just brings up really uncomfortable conversations about the potential for divorce and how you keep assets separate. So I find it to be a, a little more candid when it's just the siblings. Is this a one-time deal you have this conversation or have you seen your clients come back in and say five years when they update documents and you have another conversation? Yeah, I've been doing these meetings for about 10 years now and I'm just starting to have the first subsequent meeting. Things have changed. The kid's situation have changed. Mom and dad's net worth has increased tremendously. It's probably time to get back together and talk about who are our helpers and why and what are our wishes. So I would say uh, every five years or circumstances are changing perhaps more frequently. Is there a reluctance to do it again? I mean, you mentioned that you've seen a relief once the topics are on the table and they've gone through them. Is it less difficult the second time around? 100%. I actually saw some excitement to get the meeting on the calendar, have the family together. There wasn't that skepticism up front. And I do think it's a lot easier the second time around. Everyone kind of knows what they're in for without any big surprises. No numbers? Uh, If you showed numbers the first time, you're going to show numbers the second time. (laughs) But I like when uh, the parents or the clients put the caveat out there that here's the number, but our goal is to spend it all and you're not (laughs) going to see any of it. (laughs) That's a pretty common refrain. That's interesting. That's very interesting. So don't count on it, kids. So I have a question. You've hosted these. So you've been in the room with the family members for some of these meetings. And I imagine some of them have happened without you in the room. So how can you help that conversation? In other words, independent third party, what's the benefit? That's right. Yeah, that's a good question, Tom. I think what ends up happening, what I experience is a lot of questions come out of left field that our clients may not be able to address on like, hey, on my in-laws side, they had this trust and something went wrong and 
you know, is could this happen with my parents' situation? And we can kind of address those questions of what you've seen go wrong in another estate and why this estate's going to be better. So there's just so much misinformation out there about settling an estate and estate planning that I think an independent party kind of helps clarify and kind of keep some focus to the meeting. But you're not off the hook, Tom, because you've been in those meetings too. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and what's your feeling about them and being there? And you know, Patrice, frankly, I think I've been in two of these meetings before, so I don't have as broad of experience as Dave. Mm-hmm. It, it really has been more of a financial planning kind of meeting. The meetings that I'm involved in more often are follow-up meetings, meetings where the kids got some value out of the family meeting or maybe for other reasons, decided to meet with us and discuss their own finances. They have their own questions. And I've been part of those meetings in the past. And have you seen, have you seen basically the same thing, some relief or some understanding, or do they start asking more questions? Yeah, those meetings are more often about their own situation than about their parents' situation. So their own situation It's kind of a generational thing. While their parents are saving, have money for retirement and are spending money in retirement of what they saved, the kids most often are still in the accumulation stage. They have challenges ahead of them like paying for college, saving for retirement. Mm -hmm. So they have their own questions regarding their own finances. Okay. Dave, you were going to say something? Well, I forgot something obvious. One of the main reasons our clients want us in the room is just so their kids know who they're working with in the event that something happens. And so having that connection with the advisor, I find I end up having a lot, to Tom's point, I end up having a lot of follow-up conversations once I meet them. There's a face to the name. There's more comfort with, okay, these are my parents' advisors. But it's also important to draw the line on confidentiality. So Mm -hmm. that's something we do in the meeting too, that, hey, this meeting is something that our clients wish to have with their family. This is a one-time event. You call us. We're not saying anything about their situation. But likewise, if the kids call us, we'll keep that confidential too from the parents. So I think it's important to everyone to know that those lines are drawn. All right. Any other thoughts before we wrap this up? It's a good conversation. Yeah. I don't want to underestimate how tough it is to do to open that document and start outlining your affairs so someone else can pick up from where you left off to scheduling a time to sit down with your family. But it is amazing the peace of mind and just the uh, big sigh of relief that we see from families when we have these conversations. And to the earlier point, you're absolutely making yourself vulnerable Mm -hmm. because family questions are going to come up from left field. And there's plenty of examples out there of estates that have not gone well. So I think having this conversation, having that document are some of the key steps to making sure that your legacy is carried out and that your family can grieve your passing and know that the financial stuff and the passwords and all of that, that there's a plan for those. Yes, indeed. These can be some really tough topics, but the two of you have offered some very valuable insight and incentives, actually, to set aside the time or a talk. So how can listeners reach out? If they've got questions, they want to just get in touch with you and talk. The best place to find us is our website, fosterandmotley.com. While you're there, you can search family letter and you'll find a template that lays out a lot of the items we've talked about today. Dave Nee neighbor, Tom Guidi for Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Make sure you subscribe and get every new episode. And of course, share with friends. And especially in this case, share with your family. I'm Patrice Sikora. And let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to Foster and Motley, a podcast about wealth and life. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information discussed and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Foster and Motley. The content including mention of specific investments or planning techniques, is for informational and for educational purposes only. It is not intended as a recommendation or a substitute for professional financial advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor 
or other qualified financial service provider with any questions regarding your financial planning and investments. Foster & Motley is not affiliated with any third-party providers. Any mention of a third-party provider does not imply an endorsement of that provider. If you decide to utilize a third-party provider, you do so at your own risk.